Here we are in Ejimante, a community of over 500 people, 24 kilometers north of the capital city, Accra, Ghana, and the site for Project Access to Clean Water for Ejimante, a water and sanitation development project spearheaded by Sangu Delhi, Daryl Fington, and Indubisi Okereke, and sponsored by the Department of African and African American Studies at Harvard, the Du Bois Institute, and the African Development Initiative. As of 2007, when Project Aqua started, the community here in Ejimante had at its water source this spring right here. For all their water needs, drinking, washing, cooking, cleaning. And this source also helped the surrounding communities neighboring about 1,500. When the Project Aqua team came and tested this water, it revealed positive and alarmingly dangerous levels of E. coli and other infectious bacteria which created a whole host of water-related diseases and health implications. We will be discussing this with Stanley Bolo, an environmental health assistant with the South Ekripim Water and Sanitation Team. This is Stanley Bolo, who is going to discuss with us today the health implications of finding out that the spring has positive and high levels of E. coli and infectious bacteria. Stanley, how does the spring in Ejimante get contaminated with E. coli and other infectious bacteria? Since this spring flew from far, it might carry a lot of uh, uh, human waste and those farm around using chemicals. It can enter into the stream, which will cause the endless health. And so Stanley, for communities like Ejimante that drink this contaminated water, what are the health implications? What kinds of diseases do we see in these communities? The, the, the diseases that we are likely to see at Ajimanti are the resia, um, uh, the diarrhea, and the uh, guinea worm. It is no surprise, therefore, that baseline surveys show that the most common illness plaguing the community was diarrhea. So the team got together and decided to go on an intervention which initially panned on a solar-powered spring cleaning system, only to come to the community and discover that there was a broken down solar cleaning system that already existed and had failed. So we sought to find out why it failed and how can we learn from its failure. To the best of my knowledge, you see, for any intervention to succeed, you need a little more of community participation. Communities cherish participation in any intervention that you put up. And so right from the onset, I think that the community wasn't so much involved from the planning to the implementation to the monitoring and the evaluation. And so I think the community should have been more involved in the intervention. Apart from that, the technology was not too familiar to the community. And so when you have a technology that is not familiar, the community is not able to identify with that uh, technology to be able to implement it or to be able to, um, as it were, um, work with it. So the next intervention the team decided on was to rehabilitate an existing well in the community. We're now at the site of the old well with our partner on the ground, Abu Abdurrahman from the Ekriapim Community Development Program. Buried in these bushes, is the old well, which has been abandoned since 2002. Abu, why has the well been abandoned? This well was abandoned because a lady who was insane fell in this um, uh, water and she was rescued. Uh, later, we came to uh, disinfect the well and pump the water out and ask them to reuse it, but the community refused to use it based on their traditional beliefs that if somebody fa falls in this water, it means that it is contaminated and they, they don't have to use it anymore. So can we just rehabilitate the old well and solve Ejimante's problem of lack of access to clean water? It is not possible to rehabilitate it because it will be a waste of money. Uh, the community has refused to drink from this well. So even if it is rehabilitated, they will still not use it. So what would you recommend? Uh, I recommend that uh, we install a new borehole in the, within the community. That will be very close to the community, to the users. 
so that the access to safe water will be increased. Because the distance from here to the community is about 1.5 kilometers. And within the community water and sanitation guidelines, if you are getting water from this distance, you don't have access to safe water. So it should be close to the community so that it could be within 300 meters radius. With that recommendation from Abu, our partner on the ground, the team then decided in consultation with the Community Water and Sanitation Agency, the District Assembly, the Ministry of Water Resources and Water Aid, we then decided in conjunction with the community to go for a borehole intervention to get Ejimante access to clean, safe and reliable water. A borehole is one of the type of portable water that the community water and sanitation at the district or municipal provide for the communities. And a borehole is drilled by a machine. And then normally the diameter is six centimeters. After drilling, we put a lot of uh, uh, what we call uh, pipes into it, and then we put a hand pump with it for the people to, use, to pump with the water, and the water will come out. Ejimante has a contaminated spring. Does this borehole solve the problem? Yes, it will help solve the problem because the borehole is indeed the center of the community. The issue is accessible to the community members. What about the quality of the water? The quality of the water depends on the nature of the rocks in the ground. Over here, most of the rocks contains ions and mag magnets. Indeed, a couple of months after installing the borehole, we received complaints from the community that their white clothes and buckets were being stained. We came to investigate and discovered that the borehole water had traces of iron ore and manganese deposits. The water wasn't clean because when you wash your clothes with it, it became a different color. So you couldn't use it for anything else. It wasn't clean enough for us to drink it. So we wasn't drinking it. The taste of this water was, we, we, we wasn't able to drink it. And so the next course of action was that we had to construct and build a water treatment iron ore and manganese removal plant. George, how does this plant work? This treatment plant is called McAfee plant, and it was designed by one of the engineers of Community Water and Sanitation Agency, Ghana. The idea is to remove the iron content from it. And this plant is connected to the borehole. So as you pump the water from the borehole, it goes into the tank. And there are a lot of layers in the tank. So as the water passes through the layers, it removes the iron content before you fed the water. So does this plant solve the problem of the iron ore and manganese deposits? This iron treatment plant reduces the iron content, but not 100%. But it reduces it to well health organization standard. How was the water after the treatment plant was constructed? After they built the filter, the water was clean. And after the filter was put in and you washed your clothes, did you see any problems? No, there wasn't no problem with it. Now that we had installed the borehole and solved the problem of iron ore and manganese with the treatment plant, one would think our intervention is over and we could pack and go home. But research has shown that the provision of clean water is insufficient without paying attention to sanitation. Uh, well, sanitation and water are bedrocks. And I believe that having only good water does not guarantee good health. In Community Water and Sanitation Agency, we believe that water sanitation and hygiene gives good health. So if you have good water, but bad sanitation practices can also lead to having other diseases related to sanitation. So after providing the water, you don't end there. If you want to solve the water and sanitation related issue in the community, you have to add sanitation to your intervention. Next we will be having a discussion on why sanitation was crucial to this project and how we decided to implement a latrine construction program in the community. Yeah, um, in the past, we used to promote a lot of public latrines, which is communally used. But what we realized was something which belongs to everybody ended up being nobody's business. No one took care of it. And to have a personal household latrine in your home becomes your sole responsibility to take care of it. So the cleaning and making sure that people have access to it 
is easier. When it's at the communal level, you have to travel some distance, and that uh, gives the temptation for people to defecate around bushes and on refuse dams and other things. And because it's not well kept, it becomes very dirty. But when it is in your home, you take care of it. You make sure that it is always cleaned daily. And also, you have the kids having access to it so they won't go to the bush. We have the risk of having um, snake bites, being cut with broken um, bottles and other things. So if you have the facility at home, then you are, you, you are talking of your safety your comfort when you have a vista, the person can readily go there and have ease himself easily as compared to having to queue in the communal latrine. So that's one of the advantages of having a household latrine. We are now in the community with Olivia Otapa, who is going to tell us about her experience with the household latrines before and after it was constructed. Until Olivia. Where's mother? How did you find the latrines when you use the community and now when you have it in your house? There is a different kinds of uh, the government one, the public latrine, and the house toilet. It's so many, many different. The government one, there are some many people who make a very long line. The time you go to the public latrine, there is so many, 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 many people on there. Before you come here to make our toilet for us, nobody go to the public latrine again. We are have our own toilet. So my brother, I'm so happy. As I said, community water, we go, we say it's a three-part uh, intervention. And the three-part intervention is having hygiene, water, and sanitation. So if you've provided the water, you've provided the sanitation, then you have to also in include hygiene intervention because someone can have good clean water but without education the person can go and fetch the good clean water and have it contaminated if not educated on the kind of receptacle to use to collect the, f the water and then even how to use it in the home to make sure that it is portable straight from the collection point to the transportation to the storage so we take care of that through hygiene promotion so I would say that having the two interventions doesn't solve the problem. You also have to add hygiene promotion to ensure that the work is complete. Yeah. One of the cardinal principles of Community Water and Sanitation Agency is hygiene promotion and sustainability of installed facilities. Community ownership and management. So, to ensure that facilities that have been installed are well managed to promote health, good health, community-based organizations are put in place. These community-based organizations we call water and sanitation teams. They are members of the community that are selected by the community members by the community itself and tasked with the responsibility of promoting hygiene to ensure that the facilities that have been put in place are used to promote the health that we are talking about. The Watson Committee consists of uh, hygiene officers and then caretakers, fund mobilizers, or uh, what do you call them? Treasuries. The Watson Committee is responsible for the overall management of the installed facilities. They are given training in community mobilization, organization of meetings and then management of the funds, taking care of the facility so that it doesn't break down. The community is brought together to plan how they will raise funds and then deposit these monies in a bank account so that in case 
the facility breaks down, the water facility breaks down, they are able to get money to repair it. Project Aqua was originally a three-month project. We go in, fix the spring, and head out. But had we done that, the community of Ejimante would have gone back to using the contaminated water spring and they would have had a negative bias towards future interventions. Project Aqua ended up being a full-blown water and sanitation project that spans two years and counting. Ejimante taught us that development has no timeline. You cannot impose a start and an end date for a project. You have to work with the community and you have to stay fully committed to the project. And above all, your approach to development must be holistic. And that is the philosophy of social engagement at the Department of African and African American Studies at Harvard and the African Development Initiative. Development must be holistic.